This video will go over separable equations, what they look like, what the method is for solving those equations, as well as several examples. So the first thing is to look at what a separable equation is. Separable equations are first order differential equations. So you will have at most a first derivative, in fact, exactly one first derivative. Notice also the key defining feature of a separable equation. Specifically, you're able to factor whatever the expression is for the derivative into two terms, where each of those terms is in only one variable. So classically speaking, it's easy to see that this first example is a separable differential equation. We were able to factor the derivative into two pieces. x squared only has the independent variable. x plus 1 only has the dependent variable. But notice here this next example. This example is also a separable equation. Why? Because it can be factored. Notice in this second term only has the dependent variable. In this first term, there is no variable, and that's okay. Okay, so watch out. This one here is the sort of, if you will, trick format of a separable differential equation. Now, the method for solving these separable differential equations is relatively straightforward. In fact, it's the most straightforward of all of our methods. Firstly, of course, you have to start off with a separable equation. Then the whole point of, or the whole point of the method for separable equations is you're going to literally separate the two components, the two factors, if you will. So just for ease of notation, we're going to go ahead and call here this second factor that has only the dependent variable, this h of y. We're going to talk about its reciprocal, so 1 over p of y. Then what can we do? We can rewrite our separable equation where it's g of x and 1 over p of y. It's going to make sense in just a second. In order to separate, what will we do? You multiply by on both sides by the reciprocal of the factored part that has your dependent variable. So when you multiply by the reciprocal, that's the same as if it's in the format 1 over somebody, just flipping. And that's why we went and did this correlation here. Now, we also want to make sure all of our dependent variables are on the same side, so we'll multiply both sides by dx. And if you've done this correctly, at the end of the time when you've separated all of your variables, you should have only your dependent variables on one side, only your independent variables on the other side, and your differentials, your dy, your dx in this situation, need to be on the top of a fraction. In other words, you shouldn't even see a fraction involved anymore. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, once you have it in this form, we're just going to integrate. So we simply put the integral symbol in front of each side, and then we'll actually f grab those antiderivatives. And remember, in terms of Calc 2, when we did the standard notation for antiderivatives, the capital letter here indicated antiderivatives. And in every case, there's a constant of integration that comes out. It's totally fine to have one on both sides, but standards are people don't bother with that constant of integration over on the dependent variable side. Why? Because you can subtract it from both sides. Okay. So here's that alternative format. Now, a couple of things to note. First thing is you have to, have to, have to, have to, have to match your differential, your dy or dx, dt, whatever variables you have, to the variable before integrating. So notice here in this first step before we integrated, back when we were doing all of the algebra, we have the dy is with a factor that had the y's, dx is with a factor that had the x's, and notice here this factor is not the same as the original, it's actually the reciprocal of the original factor because you moved it to the other side. This here goes hand in hand with the fact that you cannot have any more than one variable per side of your equation. If you do, you're going to do something wrong. So let us now look at an example and suppose you have the following example. So this is actually a format, a standard format of a differential equation. Notice your derivative here is split into the dx and the dy, so it's already not in that fractional form, that Leibniz form. We've got stuff here multiplied by your dx. We've got stuff here multiplied by your dy and then equals zero. 
So what we'd like to do is we'd like to solve this differential equation. So the question, of course, is, is it separable? Because right now that's the only technique that we know. So if we want to separate those variables, there's actually a couple of different things that we could do. And one of the things we could do is we could actually solve for dy over dx. We could then factor the other side. So we could do something like dy over dx equals something with only x's times something with only possibly y's and do the same thing that we talked about in our method, same as previous examples that we've looked at before now. Okay? I'm going to do it a slightly different way. And the reason I'm going to do it a slightly different way is because we already have the dx as well as the dy broken out of this fraction. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to move one of these two guys and it doesn't actually matter which of these two terms. So I'm going to do a slight trick before we do the substitution. And the slight trick is I'm going to multiply both sides by 2. Okay. Now that will become obvious why we did that here in just a second. So let's go ahead and do the calculate the integrals of both of these sides. And I'm going to focus in on the side on the left here first just because it's on the left. So we're looking at this integral of 2y over 1 plus y squared. When you do your substitution, you pick your favorite letter. U is common. And in a fraction, you typically check to see if the denominator can be your U or whatever variable you pick for your substitution. Don't forget the DU. It's super duper important. So here your DU would be 2y dy. Notice why I put the 2 in earlier. That was just to make our life easier. And it was totally cool to put in the 2 because we multiplied both sides by that 2. Which means we now have for our integral du over u, and we know that the antiderivative of that is simply a natural log plus some constant of integration. Okay. So we'll go ahead and plug that in over here. So this is going to be a natural log of u, but remember u was 1 plus y squared, and since 1 plus y squared is never negative, think about plugging stuff in, um, you actually don't need the absolute values, parentheses are just fine. Okay. So that takes care of one side. Now the other side here we've got the integral of negative 2x e raised to the negative x squared dx. Here when you pick your substitution, I'm not going to pick u because u is already involved on the other side. Now since I am doing this in scratch work, if we picked u again, it's totally fine. But if you did in fact do all of this, what I've put to the side is scratch work in your actual equation as most people do. You can't have a u on one side equaling something different than the u on the other side of the equation. So just for good practice, Pick a different letter than u, common, the other letter is v. Now when you have an exponential or anything with an exponent involved, you always check to see is, hey, that exponent going to be your substitution. So here we've got a negative x squared. That does include variables, so that looks like a pretty decent guess for our substitution. We'll go ahead and check to see if it's right by looking at our differential. And the differential here is just take the derivative, so negative 2x dx. And at this point, we see that we have that negative 2x dx. So that actually worked out really nicely for us. This is now the integral of, what is that? It looks like ev dv. And at this point, it's super easy to take the antiderivative. This is the one that even if you forgot what the antiderivative was, you just write down the other thing. Okay. So this means our answer is going to be e raised to whatever v is, and then your constant of integration. So pulling this over, we'll have e raised to that, what's v? Negative x squared plus then the constant of integration. And I went ahead and just put the constant of integration on the side with the independent variable because while well, technically we have a constant of integration on both sides, you can subtract them and combine them together. Okay. So at this point, we've now integrated. And there I'll go ahead and write it in pretty little typed writing. Okay. And Notice also, I didn't bother with the absolute values here. Now at this point, we are technically done. This is a perfectly fine solution. It is an implicit solution. Remember what implicit means. It means we haven't solved for a dependent variable. So we haven't solved for y. So if you did need to solve for y, this one here telling you that your function is y, you can keep going. Okay. So if you go ahead and solve for y, the first thing you do is you raise both pa both of these two sides up to the exponent of e. Okay. Well, if you raise the first one up to the exponent of e, and then you raise the second one up to the exponent of e, the e and the natural log cancel, which is where you get this 1 plus y squared. 
And over here, what happens, you'll have an e raised to an e raised to a negative x squared. And then you also have, so there's the e raised to the e raised to the negative x squared. But you also have your e raised to the c. And it's multiplied because of rules of exponents. e raised to the c is just some constant. So I went ahead and put in k here, k representing my e raised to that constant c. Now, if we still want to solve for y, what happens? Well, we need to get rid of the 1, we need to get rid of the y squared. So if you get rid of the 1, you just subtract 1 from both sides. So we'll get now the subtract 1. And to get rid of the x squared, we're going to take the square root. Okay. Now, notice something that occurred right here. We have this plus or minus. When you take the square root of something, you do end up with either the positive or the negative root. And at this point, we can't actually go any further because we don't know if we're going to need that positive root or the negative root. The only way you'd be able to actually tell if you need the positive or the negative root if you were given an initial condition, initial point, where you could plug it in and figure out, oh, hey, I need this negative value, I need the positive value out front. So this deals with what happens if you need to solve for y in a funky form. But if all you care about is the answer, this one here is a perfectly fine answer as well. Depends on what you're asked to put your in, what format you're asked to put your answer in. And notice, yes, we do still have a constant here. So this is a whole family of solutions, simply because we don't have that initial condition. Now. Suppose we have another example, and this next example has a trig function in it, okay? So I'm purpose picked here uh, several different types of functions that you can see, just because in the step with the integration, uh, there's different integral rules, and this is to some extent to remind you of your integration rules back from Calc 2. The method will be identical to the question we just finished, as well as the questions that you would have seen before today. So, first thing you do is you separate out your variables. Notice in this particular case, all of your dependent variables are on the top of the fraction, all your independent variables are on the bottom of the fraction. Super duper easy to spot a separable equation. If you have a fraction, you look to see top and bottom what's going on. Okay. So, in this case, the dx is going to have to come to the other side because that's the only way it'll break out of the bottom of this fraction. dy is going to sit where he is. So, we're going to move this secant squared to the other side. And we're going to move the dx to the other side. Moving dx to the other side just means multiplying by dx. Moving secant squared to the other side means dividing by secant squared. Okay. Now, here's where trig functions can be fun. Trig functions have those tons of trig rules. So remember, secant is exactly the same as 1 over cosine. Secant squared, don't overthink it, is simply 1 over cosine squared. So if you have 1 over secant squared, you're going to have simply cosine squared. So we're going to go ahead and simplify that. Notice that's the only change is we flipped the 1 over secant squared into just cosine squared. Now we're ready to integrate because all of our variables are on the side with all of their other same variables, or all the y's are on one side, all the x's are on the other side. Please note, before you actually integrate, anytime you integrate, you always want to clean up your integral so that if there's anything that you need to multiply out or simplify or with trig functions, maybe convert with a trig rule, you want to do that before you start doing the integration so you're, not just your life is easier, so you can actually integrate it. All right. So when we integrate, first we'll put the integral symbol on both sides. Now, here is the fun part for this one here. I am going to claim that it's actually just a rule. So on this, so let's go back to see, look at this. So this guy over here, this 1 over 1 plus x squared dx, this guy is just the rule for arctangent, or if you prefer, the inverse tangent function. Now this one over here, there is a trig rule that you have to use, and that is because substitution doesn't work here. And the trig rule is that cosine squared, and I'll go ahead and put it in y, but that's not normally how the formula is written. Cosine squared equals 1 plus cosine of 2 times whatever your angle is, so 2y, all over 2. Now, when we fly in that next step, 
you're actually going to see this fraction split up. It'll be 1 half plus 1 half cosine of 2y. Okay, so write this down somewhere. That is a trig rule that you are going to need. The relating trig rules that I'm expecting you to know are, I'm going to put them over here to the side, sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. This rule. And then the relating one, which is sine squared equals 1 minus cosine of 2 theta all over 2. So those are the three trig identities that I'm expecting you to know. Definitions of trig. So 1 over secant is cosine or 1 over cosine is secant. I'm also expecting you to know those, but when I say trig identity, I'm really thinking about these three guys right here. Okay. So let's go ahead and go forward now with our integration. So we went ahead and rewrote 1 over 1 plus x squared. The antiderivative is arctangent. I went ahead and just for space put in the inverse tangent function. Over with the y's, went ahead and rewrote the cosine squared as the 1 half plus 1 half cosine of 2y. Now notice what's going to go on here. On the right-hand side, we are done. You don't have to do anything else there other than carry it down with our work. With the 1 half, this part is going to turn into 1 half y, and then we'll have this integral of cosine 2y that we're still going to have to figure out. And I went ahead and put, pulled the 1 half out front there. Now this guy right here is simply a what? It's simply going to be a substitution with a trig. And some people actually have that rule memorized in the following format. Some constant times x dx. So a is some coefficient on the x cosine. This is simply the antiderivative of cosine is, is positive sine. I almost said the derivative. Don't do that. Okay. But when you take the antiderivative, it'll be 1 over a. Okay. Which means when we go ahead and put this together, our cosine is going to turn into a sine, and we're going to divide by 2. So this is going to be 1 half cosine of 2y. And then we'll cross off that term and have our antiderivative right here. And then we'll multiply the 1 halves together. So let's go ahead and fly this in. And there's the extra information that we just said. Which means when we take our antiderivatives, we'll get that 1 half y we already said. And the 1 half times the 1 half out front will give you your 1 fourth. And this here would then be an implicit answer to the differential equation that we just looked at. Okay. Now, in this particular case, unlike the last example, we're not going to solve for y. And there's a couple reasons for that. The big one is y is actually in two places. And breaking that y out of the sine function is a pain in the butt. So we are not going to do it. So let us look at the last example of separable equations for right now. Although we will see separable equations quite a bit. So suppose we have the following differential equation. So we've got x squared times the derivative of y with respect to x. All equals this fraction right up here. We've got 4x squared minus x minus 2. Okay. Now. First thing that we want to do is we want to check to see if it actually is separable. We want to check to see if we can actually separate all of these uh, variables to the same side. So notice here where everything is going to go. The dy is going to stick around where he currently is. The dx will move to the other side, which means all of our x's need to be on the right-hand side. So that x squared is also going to move to the other side. Now when we go over on our right-hand side, all the x's can stay, that's cool, but anybody that's a y, and this y is actually already in factored form, that y is going to need to go to the other side. And remember, operationally wise, wow, that didn't come out right. Operationally speaking, slightly better English there, um, you're going to do the exact opposite operation of what's currently being done. So for the y plus 1, we're going to multiply both sides by y plus 1, so we'll get to the top of a fraction. The x squared, we're going to divide on both sides, so the dx squared will drop to the bottom of the fraction. And we're also going to multiply by dx, so that one will jump up to the top of a fraction. In other words, that mess. Okay. Now at this point in time, we're ready to go ahead and integrate. Don't overthink it. So with this guy, definitely the side with the y's is going to be easier. So this side with the y's right here. When we integrate, we'll get 1 half y squared 
plus y. I'm going to leave off in terms of the constant of integration over there. And then we're going to need to figure out what is this other side. Now, this other side with the x's is a fraction. And we remember, hopefully, from Calc 2, that fractions have a lot of possibilities. The first thing that you always check is, can I simplify this thing? In this case, not so much. Second thing you check, you check to see if this fraction looks like a natural log. So for a natural log, the thing that you're looking for is the derivative of the bottom of the fraction is on the top. And that will give you a natural log. We don't have a good way to determine that because you've got a couple of extra things you just really don't want. If your denominator factors, which is what we have because it's already in factored form, this means that you may very well be able to use partial fractions. Now remember what the check is for partial fractions. The degree of the denominator, the degree of the bottom, has to be larger than the degree of the top. So for us, let's check this. The degree of the top here is 2. I'm looking right there. And the degree at the bottom, well, we're in factored form, so we'd have to actually do a little bit of work. If we take this denominator and multiply it out, we would have x to the third plus x squared, which means the degree of the bottom is 3. Or just multiply the x squared and the x together to get that um, exponent of 3. So since 3 is bigger than 2, that means partial fractions would be something that could give us back a result here. So next step is we're going to go ahead and do partial fractions on the integral with the x's. Everything else will fly away while we do that. So partial fractions, first thing that you do is you're going to pull it out of the integral. So we're just looking at that 4x squared minus x minus 2 all over x squared times x plus 1. And all that equals, well, some fractions. Now notice what this split into. We had our factor that was the x plus 1, so that one's fine. We have our x squared term, and that was both the x as well as the x squared term because it's all the factors involved, or all the factors you can pull out of x squared as a factor. Now, notice the top of all of these guys. The top of the fraction with the x is just an a because x is linear. x plus 1 is also linear, so the top of that third fraction is a c, just all by itself. And the top of the middle fraction, the b right there, this format always matches the um, top when there wasn't a squared on your factor. In other words, this was a repeated factor right down here with the x squared. So all of the numerators and the tiny little fractions are going to match in format. They won't necessarily match in the numerical value. Okay. Now, in order to go ahead and solve for those tops, those a, b, and c in partial fractions, there's a couple different ways that you can do it. But all of the ways start off by multiplying both sides by your common denominator. Common denominator is always the denominator you started with. So we'll multiply by x squared plus x plus 1. And on the other side, we'll multiply by the same thing. We'll multiply by x squared times x plus 1. Obviously, your original denominator and the thing you multiply by will cancel, and it'll also ha happen on the right-hand side as well. So when we multiply it on the right-hand side, we'll have ax squared x plus 1 over x. Notice one of the x's will cancel. Then we'll have b times x squared x plus 1 all over x squared. The x squareds will cancel. And for c, we'll have c times x squared x plus 1 all over x plus 1. Here the x plus 1s will cancel. So putting that all together, you'll get back the original numerator. And notice this was too long, so this is all supposed to be one line. The original numerator of x, uh, 4x squared minus x minus 2 and then the stuff we had just talked about, so ax times x plus 1, b times x plus 1, and c times x squared. Now this is the point where there's two different ways to calculate your a, b's, and c's. Depending on where you've learned partial fractions in the past, you could learn either the two ways, and it doesn't matter, they're both fine. The most common and quickest way when you're dealing with linear terms is to pick some strategic values for x and plug them in. So, for example, suppose you pick x equals 0. If you plug in x equals 0, this first term right here with the a in it is going to go to 0 because you've got a factor of x. 
The term with the C in it will also go to zero because you've got that X squared right there. And over on the left hand side, you'll only get left with your negative two. So we've got negative two equals B times zero plus one or just B, which immediately gives us what B equals. Okay, so that would be the first really strategic value for x. Now the second really strategic value for x would be x equals negative 1. And that's because if you grab x equals negative 1, all of these factors of x plus 1 will also zero out. So I'll do the easy side. On the right hand side here, any term with x plus 1 will go away. So the term with the a, the term with the b will go away. Term with the c will square the negative 1, which will be positive 1. So we'll just get c. And then we just have to figure out what negative 1 plugged into this expression will equal. So 4 times negative 1 squared, negative 1 squared is 1, so that's simply 4. Minus negative 1 is going to be plus 1, minus 2, so that looks like 5 minus 2, or 3. Now, when you're picking x values, sometimes you get into a situa situation like what we just did where there's no strategic x value left to pick. So this is where you just pick one you like. I like to pick small, convenient to calculate x values. So for me, I'd pick x equals 1 next. And then we'd plug x equals 1 into everything just like what we did. So if we plug x equals 1 into the left-hand side, we'll get 4 minus 1 minus 2. So 4 minus 1 is 3, minus 2 is 1. Now, since this x value was not picked with any sort of strategy other than to not make our life super complicated, you're going to end up with a's, b's, and c's in your expression. So if we plug in x equals 1 to this first term, we'll have 1 times 1 plus 1, so 2. So this would be 2a. With the b term, we'll have 1 plus 1, so that'll be 2b. And on the C term, we'll get 1 squared or just plain old C. But here's the thing. We know what both B and C are, so we'll be able to plug in. And when you plug in, you'll actually get that A equals 1. Notice what this then tells you. You have 1. For B, you have negative 2. And for C, you have 3, which means when we're over to calculate our integral... This integral right here is exactly the same thing as simply calculating the integral of 1 over x minus 2. And I'm going to rewrite it as, instead of 2 over x squared, negative 2x to the negative 2 power. And then plus 3 over x plus 1. And note, I did the rewriting on that middle term to make the term into a standard format. So this thing tells us we have a natural log of x minus We'll add 1 to the exponent, so add 1 will get us negative 1. Divide by negative 1, so we'll get positive 2 out front. Plus, and remember here, the antiderivative of somebody of the format, if you take the derivative, it's on the top. This will turn out to be natural log of x plus 1. Okay. And don't forget the plus c that we'll put in in just a second. So notice... Same thing of pieces and parts that we did before. Carry down the antiderivative of the y's. We've got the natural log. We've got the, I wrote it earlier as 2x to the negative 1. Please note that's exactly the same thing, just in fractional form. We have the 3 times natural log of x plus 1, and we didn't forget the constant over here. Okay. Notice again, this guy is a perfectly fine format. It is an implicit solution. However, do we really want to solve for y here? We really don't, so we're just going to leave it in that implicit format.